Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? Buenos dias, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Eric. I am the youth pastor here at Canopy Vineyard Church. It is such an honor to be here with you guys. Everyone else, give them a hand. They're amazing. <laughs> They're amazing cheerleaders. Man, it's such an honor and a privilege just to be here with you guys today. Um, I, again, get the chance to open up this amazing series that we've started with the book of Joel. Um, I'm actually going to move this forward just a little bit. I feel like I'm in a cage. So, um, Is it okay if before we start, we just jump into a prayer? Is that fine? So uh, go ahead and just bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just invite you in this place. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. We ask you to invade. We ask that you transform and touch our hearts. Lord, we just ask that you use me. I ask that um, you just keep me from falling from the stage, and we just praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Awesome. I want you to just look at your neighbor and tell them it's coming back. It's coming back. That's the title of today's message. It's coming back. Look at the neighbor that you were ignoring when you walked in. Just tell him, it's coming back. It's coming back. It's coming back. I do believe that the Lord is going to do something very, very powerful today. So let's just go ahead and just jump right into the scripture. Uh, Joel chapter 1, verse 1. And just to give you a little bit of context, we're going to be talking about an invasion of locusts that came into um, Israel and just destroyed everything. Um, now, Joel, we actually don't know too much about Joel. Um, the two most important things that we know is we know the name of his dad and that the word of the Lord came to the prophet Joel. All right, so let's just go ahead and jump to Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, <laughs> the son of Pethuel. Is that pretty clever, what I did there? All right. <laughs> Verse 2. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all the inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your day or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children tell another generation. I want you to repeat with me and say, it's everyone's responsibility. Verse 4. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Now I'm going to give you guys a little bit of context of what locusts are. I didn't really fully know what they were. They're just grasshoppers. But these grasshoppers actually get for two, two to three inches long. Um, in this verse four, people actually believe that it was um, four different types of locusts, or other theologians believe there were four different stages of a locust's life. Um, now, something very important to know about these locusts is that they move in swarms. They move in thousands upon thousands. They just it's amazing. Uh, I actually have a video to better describe to you guys. Something happened in Las Vegas this past summer with some locusts. So take a look at the screen. On the Las Vegas Strip, right across from the Mirage, is this. In Sin City, it's the insect invasion putting on a show no one can escape. They popped up out of nowhere. A 24-7 onslaught of grasshoppers that really sticks with you. What the heck? Dude, you're all covered in locusts. Wow. Like, you're just covered in them, dude. For many, the first impression felt downright biblical. A migrating horde of bugs so big, you could even see them from space. Experts say a soggy winter plus a mild spring made conditions perfect for the pallid-winged grasshopper, a migratory species that should be gone in a few weeks, but till then. One thing they're known to do is mate, and that's why there's so many of them around here. To make matters worse, they're attracted to bright, especially white lights, finding their match made in heaven on the Vegas Strip. I've seen people running around away from the grasshoppers. Scientists say the invasions only happened a few times over the past 30 years, and the grasshoppers pose more of a nuisance than a threat. Either way, the critter takeover has those in Sin City hoping for once. This is kind of weird. What happens in Vegas... Ugh, that's gross. ...doesn't stay that's here. Gross. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. So how many of you guys got like the heebie-jeebies by seeing that? Right? Is that kind of weird? I wanted to give you guys a visual of what swarming locusts left. If you, if you notice, they even they showed a satellite image with the infrared, and it looked like a giant green cloud moving in. 
Now, what I want you guys to know is that um, this was a very unusual plague that came into Israel. Why? Because in this portion of the, of the world, when those plagues hit, especially with locusts, they come in from the south. This particular plague moved in from the north, which actually caught the prophet's attention. So what did he do? He pressed in and he listened. How do we know that they were northerners? Well, Joel chapter two, verse 20 actually states that. If you're a good Christian taking notes in church, right? That's, you could write that down, Joel chapter two, verse 20. And the Lord actually specifies that these are northerners that came in to invade and take the land. Some people believe that the plague took four years. Now, I don't know how many years it took, all I know is that it took years because of a statement that the Lord makes. And we'll get to that here in a second. But I, I, I just, I want to jump to verse six and seven. Now, there are four different things that actually this plague affected. All right. And I want you guys to really pay attention. Four different things and, and people also got affected. And we're just going to jump right to it. Verse six, for a nation, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Joel. For a nation has come up against my land, a powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, and its fangs are like lionesses. It has wasted my vine, splintered my fig tree, and stripped off their bark, and thrown it down, and the branches are made white. The first person that was affected by this movement or this plague was the Lord himself. Now, he makes a statement, my vine, my vineyard. That's actually referring to Isaiah chapter five when he actually calls Israel his vineyard. So this is what's so beautiful about the Lord is that sometimes we believe um, when things hit our lives, we're the only ones that are affected. And we like yell at the Lord, you did this to me. And the Lord say, look, I, I'm, I'm suffering with you. I'm the first person that got touched before you did. I want you guys to take a note. He says, my land, my vine, my fig tree. He's taking ownership of us and everything. Verse 10, the land was affected. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dried up and the oil languished. Verse 18, the animals were affected. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. And finally, verse 12, the people themselves, the vine dries up, the fig tree language, languished, pomegranate, palm, apple, all the trees of the field are dried up and the gladness dries up from the children of men. For the land, the Lord, most of all, the animals, the people. All these things were affected when the swarm came in, this plague. And I have a question for you. I have actually two questions. Number one, what is the cause of our plague today here in Grand Junction? What was the cause of their plague? What was the cause? And what have we seen the locusts come into Grand Junction and take away from us? What have we seen the locusts come in and just destroy in our lives? Those are really two deep questions. And the answer to the first one is sin. Everyone say sin. The Lord hates sin. Sin affects everything. It really truly does. When we look at these four different things that were affected, the Lord himself removing his hand, the land was affected, the animals, the people. What is that telling me? Our economy, right? Our households, our family members. What has the locusts come in and taken from us? That is a really deep and profound question. While we turn and look at God and try to blame him for all the wrong that has been happening, the Lord is just saying, especially to Israel in this context, you guys have forgotten about me. You guys have forgotten about me. I don't know if you guys know, there's a, there's a rapper that recently has been like on the news, all, all over social media. I've been sharing a lot of his stuff. His name's Kanye West. 
right? And recently, yeah, give him a hand. He's a, he's a man of God, I believe, right? He recently rededicated his life to the Lord. So much, he made a gospel album called Jesus is King. And this is what's so crazy. I saw a testimony. There was a, there's an interview, and he specifically mentions when he was five years old, he made a decision that, were, that was forever going to change his life. He walked in into his parents' bedroom. And walking into his parents' bedroom, he found a Playboy magazine. And he opened it. He said that there was a filter that was installed in his life in that moment that affected everything he did from his music, his business, his family, everything. Everything he did was revolved around sex. So that's why we like to judge him and say, well, look at his music. How could he be Christian? How could he do this? How could he do that? And he said, look, I was asleep, but now I'm woke. The Lord has woken me up and shown me there are, there are roots to my sin problem. And he showed me that it was when I was five years old and I opened that Playboy magazine. Sin affects everything we do. Sin affects our city. Sin affects our city. What's the locus? What has moved into this valley that we are wide awake to? Depression, suicide. And a lot of us are kind of okay with it. And why do I say that? Because none of us take the action to try to go out and be the light of the world. Yeah, woe is right. Look at your neighbor and just tell him, whoa, you better be awake right now. But this is what's so beautiful about the Lord. He gives us the, the, the answer to the problem. He gives us the answer. What is the answer? Let's jump to verse 13. Now, please have grace over me, okay? I, if I seem arrogant like this really handsome, good-looking man on stage is really calling the church out, I'm, I, trust me, I, my heart is, is, is in the right place. It, I first had to repent before I had to bring this message, okay? Verse 13. It says, this is what the Lord says, put on sackcloth and lament, pause, want us to pause. A couple weeks ago, Corey Sandra was here and he spoke about lament. He spoke about the importance of lament and what it is. It's complaining to the Lord, not to your neighbor, right? It's going to the Lord with the problems and not gossiping about it with, you know, Mrs. Johnson from church. Am I right? This is what lament means. Okay, I had to Google it. A passionate expression of grief or sorrow. In other words, coming into the presence of the Lord and crying out to him, Lord, I messed up. I need you. I need you. Lord, Grand Junction needs you. Lord, CVVC needs you. I need you. I have messed up so much in my life. So much. Ask my wife. (laughs) Actually, have a story about that. You know how us gentlemen like to lead our wives as healthy gentlemen, even in our bad choices? Well, I, I have done that. Now, my wife and I are four years married now. Glory to God. Yeah. I have never once had to sleep on the couch. Do you want to know my secret? I send her first, you know. <laughs> Get yourself to the couch. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on before you, you guys are judging me. You guys are judging. Some of you guys, I should have thought of that first. Um, but look, I, I took a decision. I have been here at CBBC serving for a number of years. And in those years, pride came into my heart. And all of us know that pride comes before the fall. I took some really bad decisions. I was looking for my own kingdom. I was looking for my own pulpit. I, me, I did that myself. And I pulled my wife into that. Now, for years I was serving here. I, um, I was serving with Pastor Bob at Kimwood. I, did, uh, I was leading like five small groups before cell groups. I, I was doing just a ton. Almost everything volunteering. My parents are pastors of Lavinia, the Spanish-speaking service that we have here at Cannon View. So I was serving there a ton as well. And I was just looking for my own. I was looking out for me. I got married. 
pulled my wife into my own junk. There came a poor uh, time. There came a time where um, I just got tired because I wasn't being looked at. I wasn't being recognized for what I was doing. And, you know, um, I also came to the conclusion. I was just like, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm sick of serving. I'm sick. I'm, I'm done. Like, why am I even doing this? I'm sick of Kirk, his short Asian jokes. I'm just sick of it. Every Sunday, the same thing. I only say that because he's in Thailand, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. What, Kirk? You can't even look at me in my eyes. What? You know. Anyways, I can do those Asian jokes. Jo- anyways. But look, I did. I got tired, and I brought my wife into my junk. And that caused me to do something that I would actually forever regret. And it it actually molded me. I left Cannon View. And I didn't just leave. Like a lot of people love just leaving church. They love church hopping. You know, they they come here. I don't like it. They go back. They go this. They go here. They go there. And it's just, it's too much. And I, I understood that coming into ministry, doing ministry, I saw a lot of people just doing that, making poor choices like that. I at least had a little bit of integrity for the little man that I was, and I kind of still am sometimes. So what did I do? I called Pastor Kirk, and we met at 24 Road Starbucks. Called him, hey, man, I'd like to just meet with you, whatever. We showed up. We sat down. My wife was with me. And have you ever just talked to anyone that's just really proud just very arrogant. Have you ever just talked to them? You just want to knock them out. Well, that was me, right? You like to knock me out. And I was sitting right in front of him and looking at him, I told him, you know what? We're just so grateful for Canon View for what they're doing in Junction. But you know what? I think our time is done. And Kirk just, what? It was the first time I see his eyes like open up like all the way. He's like, what are you talking about? And Oh, was that bad? No, that was, seriously, he's like, what? And, and I'm sitting there with him, and my wife is there. My wife's like, oh. And I said, you know what? It, it's time for us to leave. I, I, I got an offer with uh, another church in town. We bless what they're doing. We believe in what they're doing um, to just come in and help. I became a leader. We did a lot of crazy things. But in that time, I was just being invited to just be a part of what they were doing. And I just said, you know what? I, I think we're done at Canon View. And I didn't have fear of the Lord. Because I dared said, you know what? God told me. And you know what? It's hard to, how do you argue that? How do you argue when someone says, God told me? You're just like, well. And Kirk being, he was my spirit. He is my spiritual leader. And he was telling me, I don't hear that from the Lord. Are you sure? Let us pray a little bit longer. We don't want you to leave. Like, what is going on? And I told him, I, the Lord told me, just to end the conversation. And I left. He just patted me, said, okay, we bless you. Man, that was a hard year for me and my wife. I felt the Lord remove his hand. I went through so much. I went through so much. Our finances were going down the drain. Our, our relationship, we constantly was, we were arguing. Because again, I was sending her to the couch. I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and within the removing of the hand, I just, I came to the conclusion, it was me. So the year passed. I called Pastor Kirk. We, same, we meet in the same coffee shop, sit at the same table, sit at the same seat. The only thing that was so different was my heart. I sat in front of this man crying. My wife was in tears as well. And I repented. I went to the Lord. But he said, you need to make this right. And I went in front of Pastor Kirk and I apologized. And I just couldn't stop crying. I was humiliated. I I had shame in my heart. And man, I love my pastor. He is a man of God. I am telling you, I have met a ton of pastors. I've talked to many people that are, you know, 
And this guy, Pastor Kirk, is a man of God. He looked it straight in my eye and with so much grace said, you know what? We've been praying for you to come back. You are more than welcome to come in. And he hugged me. He embraced me. I just couldn't stop crying. Now that's a love of a, that's, that's, he's pouring out the love that he received from God. I hope you guys understand that. The Lord is moving us into this season to seek him out and turn to him. He's given us the answer to fix a lot of our problems. What's the answer? It's to repent. It's to repent. Sometimes we do things that look good, like I'm going to go help this church, but are really bad. They're really, in reality, bad. And this is what I learned during that process. 99.9% of obedience is still 100% disobedience. I'm a man now. I have moved out with my wife. I don't have no parents tell me what to do to pick up my socks. Nothing. Now, I had to be responsible for my consequences and be responsible for the choices that I committed into my own life. And I, brought, and I dragged my wife into all of this. I'm not that good of a husband. Verse 13, put on sackcloth and lament. O priests, wail. O ministers of the altar, go in. Pass the night in sackcloth. O ministers of my God. Because grain and offering... Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of the Lord. Consecrate a fast. Call a Solomon assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. The answer is to repent. And guess what, church? It starts here. It starts with you. What, what does the word repent mean? It has two meanings. Either to change your mind or the way you think, or to turn the other way. Now, we are not a burn, you know, turn and burn church. We are not that. We are just coming to the reality. The Lord is calling us back to him. He wants his children to turn back to him so we can walk in our inheritance. I have no idea why we are so ignorant. I'm talking about myself, why I don't want to. Man, sometimes he just needs to spank me lovingly. He's calling all of us to do this. We think if we just hide our sin and if I just close the door and do things behind closed doors, nobody needs to know. But guess what? It's spiritually affecting everything you do. And a lot of us in this room wonder why depression just settles in, anxiety settles in. We wonder why our finances are going down the drain. We wonder why, well, man, how come things aren't just going? And then you start finding out things that, like, we start doing counseling and we start seeing, man, you're, what are you doing? You're doing this to yourself. I had to come to the conclusion, I am a jacked up person. And the Lord is calling me to him. Turn, turn to me. I do not believe the Lord sent the locusts to Israel to punish them and spank them in this, like, because he's this judgmental God up in the clouds, just trying to just rain down havoc every single time we do something wrong. But I do believe Israel just forgot about the Lord and turned the other way and thought, you know what? I could do this without you. You know what? My business is flourishing. You know what? I got it under control. My household, at least my kids aren't X, Y, Z. Notice how our valley is being affected. And a lot of us like to just lean back. Well, everyone else should have done Dave Ramsey because I got this bank account full and stacked. But the valley's being affected because of our choices. It's us. And guess what? The Lord is calling the church to turn to him. He's calling you. He's calling me. What will happen if we turn to him? What will happen? Joel chapter 2, verse 25. This is the Lord speaking again. 
I will restore to you the years. This is where we gather. Yeah, this locust, they were bringing torment for years. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent to you. Again, the Lord is saying, I'm trying to get your attention. You shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord, your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. The Lord hates sin. The Lord hates it, but he so loves you. The Lord hates sin, but he so loves you. He so loves you. He so loves me. Why does he hate it? Because it separates us from him. It removes us. We remove ourselves from his presence. How many of you guys are parents in this room? Some of you guys have gone through torment with your kids. They just don't want to listen. And all you're trying to do is love on them and bring them into your house. And you want better for them, but you just don't understand why they don't want it. Well, let me make my own choices. That's how the Lord is feeling with us. He's trying to bring us back. Come back into my house. I do believe this word is for Canon View today. He's calling us to come back to him, to turn to him. The Lord so loves you. He has built a way out. There's a big old escape. And guess what? It cost him everything, everything. John 3, 16. Okay, my favorite verse. Verse 17 is my wife's favorite verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This escaped cost him everything, but he so loves you. That's why he did it. He did it because he so loves you. He so loves you. He so loves you. He's watching you. He's trying to get our attention. We cannot be blaming God for uh, the consequences of what we've chosen to do. I'm sorry. We just can't. A lot of us are too busy looking for other things. I want to look for prosperity. I, 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 well, this church is too much, man. I, I think I'm going to go to the next one. We, we jump too much. We become the locust, hopping around trying to do things without the Lord. And the Lord is saying, no, you're not a locust. You are my son and you are my daughter. Start acting like it. Start walking in your inheritance. Come back to my house. I want you to come back and just seek me out. I want to release. I want to restore the years that you have lost. I want to restore your family members. I want to restore your house. I want to restore your job. He wants to so bad. Now the question is, do you want it? Do you truly want it? Grand Junction is suffering, ladies and gentlemen. I see it every single day. And this is the attitude that I get a lot. And some of our pastors, well, you know what? You're the pastor. You're the one that's supposed to take care of it. And God is saying, no. Repentance starts within the church first. Yes. Then it says, call the elders. Then it says, call the assembly. And then it says, gather the inhabitants of the land. See how there's an order there? And some of us just turn to the people that aren't following Jesus and say, you need to repent. I don't, I, I don't know. That's not, that's not what scripture says. It, he says to start here with the church. It starts here. You are not an orphan. You are not meant to live this life alone. You are not. Cell groups. There's my plug. Cell groups is a great way to literally bring big church into a small community. And you actually get to have this, these intimate relationships with these people. And you start seeing, man, these people care for me. They love me. You know, it's the church and the heart of a church is the cell group. And the heart of cell group is discipleship. You're not meant to do this by yourself. James chapter five, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. It's working. You know, Pastor A.B. from Pause, the Pause Movement says, we confess to God for the forgiveness of our sins. We confess to each other to find healing. You're not meant to do this alone. And a lot of us fall into the disobedience. Well, I'm in a cell group. We come into the cell group and we try to find the cell group model and it's not a cell group. It's a, it's a place where people just like to complain about Pastor Kirk and how he wears socks with Birkenstocks and, or Berkies, you know, and you're just like, okay, like this is, this is interesting. Well, I don't know why you guys would spend so much time getting together to complain about that. But. <laughs> Discipleship is so important. We are called, I want you to note this, we are called to make, not make, we are called not to make Christians. We are called not to make churchgoers. We are called to make disciples. We are called to go out. You are called to go out. And guess what? Every day when we don't, we fall under disobedience. You don't believe me? Let's go to scripture. Matthew chapter 28, go ahead and read it. Write it down. Mark, Mark 16, go ahead and read it. Or if not, just go ahead and read all the gospels. That way you could just get the whole context and see that the Lord is calling all of us to do this. Can, we, can you like slap your neighbor and tell him to wake up? It's time for you, it's time for us to be active as a church. It's not just about putting money into a bucket, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just about making a box. It's about caring for your neighbor, caring for them. You know, instead of complaining, well, they're, they just do a lot of drugs. I don't think I could. You are called to be that light in their world. You're called to be that. Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If the worship team could come up, I'm going to call them up. You are all, we are all sons of God. All of us. The only difference between us and the world is that we have said yes to Jesus. All Christianity is, is one beggar telling another beggar where we found the bread. And if we live through that and act like we know, like we are part of this amazing family and the Lord is calling you. He wants you to come in with us. He wants, it's not, it's not just a club. This is a family where we care for each other. We love, we pray for each other. Oh, you're hungry? Let me feed you. Let me clothe you. You're thirsty? Let me give you some water. Your marriage is broken, let me, let me introduce you to someone that can restore it and that wants to restore it. We're not religious people, I promise you. We are relationship people. There is a difference. Eric Farmer shared this on Facebook the other day, and, and, and his post said, religion says, crap, I messed up. I hope my dad doesn't find out. Relationship says, I messed up. I better call my dad. No, it's, it's serious. This is what the Lord is calling us to. A relationship with him. I want you to look at your neighbor and just tell him it's coming back. It's coming back. The Lord is restoring it. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The Lord wants to restore it. Do you want it to be restored? Do you want it to be restored? That is the question today. It costs the Lord so much because he so loves you. God loves me recklessly enough that he hates the very thing that hurts me without hating me for condemning it, co committing it. He loves me so much. Church, he loves you. He loves you so much. He so loves me. I really hope you understand that.
This locust came in and the Lord just saying, I'm just trying to get your attention. Come back to me. And look, a lot of us in this room might believe like, man, you're lucky I'm even here. We're lucky the building's not burning down. The Lord loves you so much. He brought you here. He's wooing you to his presence to come back and turn to him. How many of you guys know Moses? You ever heard of Moses? There was an encounter, the first encounter he ever had with the Lord. And um, it was uh, through a burning bush. And I just imagine Moses come, coming towards the bush. And, and as he's walking towards it, the Lord speaks to him and he says, don't, don't step any closer. Take the sandals off your feet. This is holy ground. Why do you think he had him take his shoes off? I don't just believe it was just because it was holy ground. I personally believe it's because, you know what? He's thinking, if I get his shoes off, it's harder for him to run away from something in the middle of the desert without his shoes. church, the Lord is calling us. He doesn't want you to run from the encounter today. He wants you to press in. And if you need to take your shoes off so you don't run away, this is your time. This is your place. This is the time for you to just come to his presence and say, Lord, I want, I want you. I need you. This isn't about a program. It's not about just entertainment. This is to seek you. This is the whole reason why we are here. And I need you. Lord Junction needs you. CVBC needs you. We need you in our everyday lives. Lord, I ask that you transform us today. I ask that you move today. You touch our lives. We don't want to leave the same way we came in. Lord, we want to encounter you today. given your life to the Lord. This is the time. This is the place. And it's going to take a lot of faith. It's going to take a lot of faith to do this. I'm just going to ask you, I'm not going to ask you to come up and we're going to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you to stand or raise your hand. And I want the church to just look around. If they see anyone that has, you know, their hand up because they haven't given their life to the Lord, please church, press in, lay hands, pray with them, lead them in to the kingdom of God, lead them into this beautiful and if you feel, if you feel like you've strayed away, if for some reason this, this smacked you in your, in your heart, you're like, dang, this, this handsome guy, man, he read my mail. I want you guys to just raise your hand. There are people around you that want to pray with you. Lord, I just ask that you move today in worship. Just raise your hands. And at church, I want you to look around, just, just, just go to them. If you're a cell group leader, go to them and pray with them. The Lord wants to restore what you've lost. The Lord wants to bring healing and wants to bring life in that more abundantly into your life. Lord, we just ask that you move today. Lord, we ask that during this worship time, we are able to just cry out to you and, and be more like you. Father, we just want to have an encounter with you today.